in mammals, digestion begins in the oral cavity or the mouth. And it begins mechanically by chewing, right? Physically breaking apart the food into smaller bits to increase the surface area um, for the next part, which is chemical digestion. And chemical digestion also begins, at least for starch, in the oral cavity. In your saliva, you have an enzyme called amylase, uh, salivary amylase, which breaks down starches into uh, smaller and smaller uh, polysaccharides so that eventually we can break them into glucose. In the mouth, we also moisten the food and mush it up and then form it into a bolus with your tongue and the top of your mouth, and then we push that back into the throat or pharynx. Uh, and then in the pharynx, your involuntary uh, muscles take over. And once you swallow, you don't have to worry about consciously pushing that food again until, you know, the very end. And the pharynx pushes it down through the esophagus, which is your, your food tube, which sits behind your trachea or your air tube, and leads to the stomach. It is weird that your throat or pharynx handles both air and food. And so when those two uh, things separate down separate paths, uh, you have to make sure that the food doesn't go down the air tube. Right? If the air goes down the food tube, you just get a little gassy, it's fine. But if the food goes down the air tube, you have troubles. So you have an epiglottis, which is a flap that folds over the air tube when you're swallowing food. Um, and if you happen to laugh or something, or you're talking while you're swallowing food, then you have to open that flap to let the air out. And that's when sometimes you end up choking. Um, and then down the... Uh, the esophagus, we have smooth muscle that goes in a wave like this, and that's called peristalsis. And peristalsis pushes the food down through the esophagus until it gets into the stomach for further processing. And again, we have sphincters um, that are going to regulate these passageways. And the sphincter right here is sometimes called the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter because that's the, the cardiac region of the stomach where it, where it enters. Um, that prevents stomach acids from splashing back up into the esophagus and damaging it. When that happens, uh, which it occasionally does, we call that acid reflux or heartburn. And in the stomach, we mix our bolus of food with gastric juices and then mash it down into a goo, a liquid called chyme. So it's a bolus from your mouth to your stomach. It's chyme from your stomach on after. Uh, and your gastric juices are filled with um, acid. So uh, you have parietal cells here that pump out hydrogen and chloride that become hydrochloric acid in the stomach here in, in these gastric pits. And that's important for two reasons. One, uh, it kills bacteria, right? So you very rarely are infected by bacteria that come in with your food through your stomach because most of that is destroyed uh, in your stomach. Not always, not all of it, but, but most of it. Um, but also, low pH unfolds proteins, and your stomach is where you start chemically digesting proteins. So you're mechanically digesting stuff in your stomach by mashing it up, right? Your stomach churns. It's very, very muscular. It's actually got three layers of muscle in it. But you're also um, mixing it with uh, pepsin, uh, which is produced by the chief cells as pepsinogen it becomes pepsin when it hits hydrochloric acid. And pepsin is an enzyme that breaks peptide bonds. It breaks the bonds between amino acids and proteins. Uh, so unfolding those proteins because of the low pH uh, provides more surface area for this pepsin to actually do the chemical digesting. And then there's a sphincter at the end of your stomach called the pyloric sphincter, which regulates passage into the small intestines. And it opens up a little bit at a time so that you don't overwhelm the small intestines. But the small intestines is sort of the business end of your digestive tract. It's where most of the functioning happens. Uh, because it's where the, the majority of chemical digestion occurs, and it's where all of the absorption occurs. So chemical digestion of starches began in the mouth with salivary amylase. It began in the stomach for proteins, but we finish up all of the protein and, and starch digestion and do essentially all or most of the fat digestion, all of the nucleic acid digestion in the small intestines. Um, and then we absorb those things across the intestinal wall, into uh, the, the capillaries. And the small intestine has three main parts. The first part is the duodenum or duodenum. And this is where we dump all the, um, the stuff from the stomach, the chyme, and also your pancreatic juices, 
which include all those enzymes we were just talking about, and some alkaline uh, buffers to to uh, to neutralize the pH. We don't want all that acidic chyme destroying your small intestinal wall. And then also uh, your liver produces bile, which is stored in your gallbladder and then dumped into your duodenum. And then we can begin the process of emulsifying fats. So as a quick summary, this is where everything gets digested in your uh, digestive tract. So uh, carbohydrates begin getting broken down in your mouth with that salivary amylase. They don't get digested at all in your stomach. And then in your small intestines, the pancreatic enzymes, in this case, pancreatic amylase, begin to uh, complete that digestion of starch. And the very last bit of digestion, so those disaccharides, get broken apart into monosaccharides like glucose uh, in enzymes that are stuck in the wall of your intestines, in the epithelium. Right? You have these little villi that increase the surface area of the wall of your intestines. The wall looks very like fingery because, uh, again, wavy means higher surface area for absorption. And on those villi, you have enzymes uh, that break these disaccharides into monosaccharides. And then you can absorb glucose across the intestinal wall. Proteins, you don't start digesting until your stomach, right, because of pepsin in the stomach. Uh, and then we continue to do the digestion of proteins in the small intestines with some other enzymes called trypsin and chymotrypsin. And just like with carbohydrates, the last bit of digestion occurs with enzymes that are fixed in the wall of the intestines. And they break those dipeptides into individual amino acids, and we absorb them across the wall. Uh, nucleic acids like DNA and RNA, we don't even start digesting them until the intestines. And there are uh, nucleases, which break down nucleic acids, produced by the pancreas in your small intestines. And again, we break that stuff all down. And, and just like with carbohydrates and proteins, the last bit of breakdown occurs with enzymes in the wall, and then you absorb those nucleic acids. The ones that are a little bit different are fats. Uh, fats are broken down by pancreatic lipase. Uh, but uh, we do this more effectively when you have bile from the liver and the gallbladder there, um, because fats tend to get glumped into one big, you know, if you mix oil and water, they don't stay mixed, right? The oil clumps up in one big ball. Um, and so um, putting bile in there is like putting a detergent, like putting Dawn dish soap in there and shaking it up. Instead of having one big glob, you have lots of little globs. That increases the surface area of the fats so that the lipase, the enzyme, can actually digest them into their component parts. So bile does not digest fats, right? Doesn't cause any chemical reactions to occur, but it does um, break them down into smaller globs of, you know, of these chemicals so that you have more surface area for effective breakdown of lipids by pancreatic lipase. So your pancreas is essential because it produces all of these enzymes that that break down all of these things, right? Uh, tons of enzymes come from the pancreas, and also it produces alkaline solutions that neutralize the acidic chyme coming from the stomach, and the bile uh, is produced by the liver, and that helps to emulsify these fats. So not chemically break them down, but, but emulsify them so instead of one big glob, you have lots of tiny globs. And bile is produced by the liver, but it's stored in your gallbladder because you only need it when you're eating a lot of fats. Uh, so it stays in there until you eat, you know, a big slice of cheese pizza, and then your gallbladder squeezes and dumps all that extra saved bile into your intestines. As I mentioned, your small intestines have lots of surface area. They have these, these folds, these ridges, and then if you look closely, you can see those little fingers I was talking about, right? These are the fingers, the villi. And even the villi, the cells that line them, have their own little microvilli on them. So incredible amount of surface area. And when you absorb these things, you pick them up into the blood capillaries and they are taken off to the liver. So everything that you absorb gets taken directly to the liver. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, directly to the liver so that you can process those nutrients before they go to the rest of your body. So by the time you get to the large intestines, uh, you have essentially done all of your absorption of nutrients. There's very little left to do except to reabsorb water um, that that you've dumped into your digestive tract so that you don't get dehydrated. And so if, if food does not stay in your large intestines long enough to reabsorb all that water, you end up getting rid of that, you, of that water with your stool, and that's diarrhea, right? And diarrhea can cause you to become very dehydrated. 
if food spends too much time in your large intestines and you reabsorb too much water, then you can get um, you know, hard feces and it can be difficult to, to uh, get rid of it. The first part of your large intestines is your cecum. This is where plant material collects and, and in a lot of organisms, um, the cecum is large and it's where you ferment uh, cellulose, plant material, um, less so in humans. Uh, we also have an appendix that sticks off. It plays a small role in immunity, and it tends to be a place where we hold a bunch of beneficial bacteria uh, that if we ever you know, get sick and, and lose much of our bacteria, we can repopulate that with stuff in the appendix. So here you can see where the small intestines meets the large intestines, which starts with this cecum, this pouch with the appendix hanging off. And then we go up through the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, because it looks like an S, to the rectum. So the colon is the main part of the large intestines. And this is where we do most of that reabsorption of water. You also are going to have bacteria there that are going to break down some of the cellulose that you couldn't break down earlier. Right? We don't have enzymes to break down cellulose, um, but you can still get some vitamins from that. And so those bacteria are helpful. And then the rectum is where we store this stuff before we get rid of it. So when the rectum gets full, it stretches the wall and that tells you that you have to go to the bathroom. And we have two sphincters that control um, passage through the anus. The anus is the canal, the rectum is the, the um, sort of storage area. Uh, the one is involuntary, it's smooth muscle, and that's automatic. When the rectum stretches, it relaxes and, and you push things out. But fortunately, you have a second sphincter that is skeletal muscle, which means you have conscious control over it, and that means that you have some ability to hold it, whew, you know, until class is over. So amongst most vertebrates, you have essentially one common plan of a digestive system, but there are a lot of differences and variations on that plan depending on what your diet is. And one of the most obvious places where you see variation is in dentition. Uh, so different kinds of animals have different kinds of teeth depending on what they eat, uh, especially mammals which have specialized teeth for different diets. But even in, for instance, snakes, you see modified fangs for injecting venom. Within mammals who have, uh, again, this specific variation in teeth, these specialized teeth, in carnivores, you're going to see uh, much more pronounced canines for tearing and incisors for, for slicing. Um, and in herbivores, you're going to see much more pronounced molars and premolars for grinding up plant matter so that it's easier to digest. And in omnivores, you're going to see some combination of both. Additionally, carnivores tend to have much shorter uh, intestinal tracts than herbivores. And part of that is because herbivores need more time, especially in the cecum area uh, and in the colon, where bacteria can break down the cellulose in the plants for them. Uh, plants are difficult to digest, and so they need more space, again, and help from bacteria to do that. Whereas meat is much easier to digest, but also, if you're eating bad meat, you want to pass it through you more quickly, right? So that, that you know, bad bacteria don't have time to cause infection. So the size of the cecum and the size of the colon, colon are much, much different between carnivores and herbivores. A lot of herbivores have specialized chambers for microorganisms to ferment uh, these cellulose molecules uh, to allow them to, to break down these plants that, that the animals can't break down themselves. And the most elaborate adaptations are in ruminants like cows. You may have heard before that cows have multiple stomachs, and that's sort of true, uh, at least in the sense that they have multiple chambers where they allow food to ruminate, right, the ruminants, and to hang out with bacteria and allow fermentation to take place. And that fermentation allows them to break down the cellulose. Fermentation also produces a lot of gas, right? This is why, you know, cows uh, cow farts are a, a real thing, right? They produce uh, a lot of methane uh, out. Well, it's really not farts. It's actually probably more burps, um, but but both. Anyway, uh, but that's from fermenting all of this, uh, this plant matter so that if you live on grass, you can still get enough of the vitamins and minerals and calories that you need.